Hey, everybody, it's Rob again. It's time for another Member Talks. This is an exciting one because it's something that we have never talked about before. This is a topic that we wanted to bring to you. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I want our presenter to share the story. Uh, I am going to uh, invite you and, and uh, to sit back, relax, as we meet Suzanne Elsolt. Did I, did I say your name right? Elsolt? That was good. Very good. <laughs> Suzanne is, uh, Suzanne's actually from the west side of the state or, or lives on the west side of the state and she trains human remains detection dogs. It, it, to me, that's just absolutely amazing. I don't want to tell your story. I want you, Suzanne, to tell your story. Tell us, first off, I, I, I see, I, I can hear an accent there. Tell us where you're from, how you got here and, and how you got into human remains detection. Okay. Well, it's a long story, so I'll try to abbreviate it the best I can. Um, I came here uh, when I was 20 years old uh, on a scholarship uh, to do my graduate work at the University of California. And uh, I, I had met my uh, husband. He is American, but I'd met him in Sweden when he was doing his undergraduate work over there. Ah. And to make a long story short, after we uh, had our master's um, uh, completed. Uh, we traveled the West Coast and ended up in Seattle. It reminded me a lot of Sweden with all the water and the skiing and the mountains. And um, So we settled down here and we've lived here for a long time now. Um, we live in a little town called Edmonds. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually, as I look out the window now, I'm looking out over Puget Sound. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. And um, the uh, how I got involved in uh, human remains detection is an even longer story, but I spent uh, several decades in the corporate world. And in the early 1990s, uh, I felt burnt out and I decided to leave that world and uh, redesign my life, essentially. And uh, I uh, set up a, an executive coaching practice, uh, which took off and has been doing very well for several decades now. But I also set out to find a more meaningful way to give back to my community. And uh, you know, I've done the rotary thing uh, for many years and I was kind of tired of that. And uh, the real catalyst for me was really 9-11. Uh, that was the year uh, our daughter went to college. And so we had, my husband and I had started looking seriously at you know, how are we gonna spend the rest of our lives together. And he was a member of Mountain Rescue. Um, and of course, when 9-11 happened, we all saw the dogs um, uh, on TV. And it was almost as if all the pieces of the puzzle fell into place for me because I love the outdoors. I've been a mountaineer my whole life. And I always wanted to have a dog. And so dog outdoors became hiking with a purpose with my dog. And um, I found out that uh, the, lo the county that I live in had a small uh, canine group, and I joined that. And um, initially, I trained my dog, um, uh, his name was Busse, uh, in Wilderness Air Scent. So we were primarily looking for live people. Mm -hmm. But um, very early on in, my, in our career, uh, we ended up on a very gruesome murder case. And that's when a little seed was planted in my head. Uh, and the question was, could I, could I train a dog to find the dead? And uh, interestingly, now 20 years later, uh, my two dogs that I currently train, that's the single uh, purpose for both of them. I only do oh. human remains detection with both my dogs now. And that's after having done avalanche, first responder disaster and wilderness uh, for many years. Um, that's kind of the area I'm specializing in now. I'm not an expert, but I'm learning. <laughs> now, um, is, I guess, how do you ask, is, what's the difference between human remains detection and we hear cadaver dogs all the time. What is there a distinction there between the yeah, both? In my in my mind, there is, um, mm -hmm. and probably it's kind of like a, asking a lawyer for advice. You'll get a lot of different answers. But in my mind, uh, a cadaver dog is a dog that typically is deployed on missions to find more recently uh, deceased remains, typically full bodies. Uh, 
Yeah. And a human remains detection dog, uh, which is what I'm training for in specific, uh, are dogs that are used uh, on cold cases, um, you know, looking for articulated remains, skeletal remains that maybe have been out there for decades. Um, trace, uh, maybe looking for a blood splatter or blood drop. Um, and so it's a much more detailed uh, kind of use of human remains detection dogs than, than I would uh, say a cadaver dog is. You mentioned decades. How far back can, can dogs, I, I was, how, how far back can they detect? How, how, how long can a person be deceased that they can still detect them? Well, there is, uh, you know, there are people in the country that are specializing in historical remains detection with their dogs. And uh, um, they have gone all the way back to the Stone Age and uh, been able to detect human remains. And actually, I was very fortunate because I go to Sweden every summer with my dog and uh, I train um, search and rescue dogs and human remains in Denmark and Sweden. And I happen to have a, a very good friend from high school days who is a recognized archaeologist in Sweden. And a few years ago, uh, she actually was able to borrow bones from the Stone Age. And um, she and my group of girlfriends uh, put them out in a, in a park without me knowing where they were removed themselves and I let my dog go out and by Jove, he, he actually identified uh, both um, uh, Stone Age remains that they, that they put out the bones. No and, uh, so it's, it's the volatile organic compounds in the, in, the, in the human remains that they are hitting on. And I guess that doesn't change whether it's, you know, 2000 years old or two years old. <laughs> well, how, I can barely get my dog to sit half the time and stay. I mean, how do you train? How do you train your dogs to be human remains detection dogs? And, and I'm assuming there's a team of people that you would have that, that know how to handle dogs with this specialized training. How do you train the dogs and how do you train the handlers of the dogs? That's a good question. I mean, as, um, as search and rescue volunteers, uh, we first have to be trained in what's called the core competencies in Washington state. So we have to be trained in, anything from, you know, how to uh, exit and enter a helicopter to navigation to first aid and CPR, um, you name it. And that in itself uh, is something that can take quite, quite a time and be, be preferred to not even have handlers come into our, our dog group before they have that under their belt. Um, then it's a definite advantage if uh, handlers come in and have some dog experience, which I actually did not have when I first got involved 20 yeah. years ago. Um, the most, most teams start as trailing or air scent teams looking for living people. But that's kind of changing over time too. We're seeing a lot, an influx of human remains detection handlers now. And I think it's because we're being called out increasingly for human re remains detection missions. And my theory is that partially that's because of DNA research uh, progressing and uh, you know, law enforcement is pursuing more cold cases. And so we're being increasingly called out on that. So I'm seeing across the country, all of a sudden, the last few years, a lot more human remains detection dogs. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, the general public probably doesn't know, um, and, and it could be off-putting for some, is that in order to train our dogs, we have to train them on the full spectrum of human remains. Um, because there are, like I said, I think, four to 500 volatile organic compounds and the dogs have to be exposed to all of them because we have no idea when we're out looking for a clandestine grave or um, you know how old the remains are or how, how much they have decomposed. I mean, that all depends on the number of factors. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, we basically start out by imprinting the dogs uh, on um, the whole spectrum of human remains or as much as we can. And that means we have to essentially use uh, the real thing. 
um, which in many states um, can be very difficult. Um, my friends, um, they run and hide when, we, when they see me if they're about to have a knee replacement or anything like that, because I'm like a hawk. So, oh, a knee replacement. Could I have your knee? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, you're having a baby. Could I have your placenta? Um, and there are places like uh, the bone room where you can actually purchase bones. And um, uh, that's something that I do. But, but again, it's very hard for us to get our hands on the real thing. And of course, you have to be very, very respectful with how, you, how we deal with it. And you have, um, uh, you know, you have to keep impeccable records and keep, keep it under lock and boom and, um, you know, really treat it very professionally. And so there's a whole range. The training for a handler in human remains detection is so interesting to me anyway, because it's all the way from learning about meteorology and the wind and the temperature and the weather to geology, uh, you know, what impact does the different kinds of soils have on decomposition uh, to... Um, you know, just the history around what we're looking for. Um, there are, uh, I'm bringing in a trainer or my, my group is bringing in a trainer from a master trainer from Tennessee this summer to do a five day workshop for 12 human remains detection teams in Washington state. And um, I know last year, I think it was last year, he spent a month over in Europe uh, helping, I think it was a history flight uh, that he helped locate uh, human remains from uh, armed services members from the Second World War. Yeah. Um, oh. So, you, you know, you get into history, meteorology, geology, um, and more. Um, mm -hmm. Soil analysis, I mean, things that I would have never expected if I, somebody had asked me years ago um, that I would be doing this. So, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the... Um, handler part of it right and the dog part is um i mean my opinion and you know, i'll start with just working on the relationship with my pups when i get them because you do develop an incredible bond uh with your dog doing this kind of work where you're essentially exposed to life and death uh, situations and uh, so that bond between me and my dog is critical and um you have to be able to uh, feel through the leash. You have to be able to read your dog. The dog has to be able to read you. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an intricate dance when you finally get that synergy going between, between the two of you. Yeah. Um, but it's a very uh, systematic way we, uh, we, we go from imprinting to, um, you know, it, Increasing the complexity of the environment, uh, the complexity of the scent picture, you know, overlapping scent, scent pictures, um, different weather, um, different kinds of soil, you know, buried finds, high finds, uh, anything in between, working on buildings, working on cars, working in the wilderness, um, working in urban areas. Um, so it, it's and then you have to introduce in, uh, distractions. You know, you can't have your dog go out and uh, alert on animal bones or animal remains or on hot dogs in the uh, garbage can. You know, it's the... Uh, <laughs> so it, it usually takes, you know, if you have an, a seasoned experience handler, you, you, you might be able to get a dog certified in human remains detection in a year or so. But you know, I would say more typically a couple of years and uh, in my experience, when I look at all the disciplines, and I was instrumental in building a very large canine team, um, and I would say that ultimately only about 10% of the prospects we had coming in the door uh, that had watched the glorified pictures of search and rescue dogs and wanted to do that, only about 10% of them ultimately ended up certified and deploying in search and rescue. Sure. It's a huge time commitment, if nothing else. It's, uh, I would say, on an average, the last 15 years, you know, on top of my, my day job, I've been putting in 15 to 25 hours a week doing this kind of work. Yeah. yeah. It's a regular part-time job, for sure. 
Absolutely. I mean, and we're driven by passion. You know, we're, that, that's why we do it, because we're all passionate about doing this. And I'm sure the training is such that you need to get out and get in various different um, areas. Can you train in cemeteries where we know there are a lot of deceased? Can you train at uh, body farms? How, how does that training I mean, can you can you go different places like that and be part of that, have that part of the training regiment? Yes, absolutely. It's a really good question. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is that probably five to ten years ago, we, we in this line of work started hearing more about body farms. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, because, because what people found out was what we train the dogs on typically is small stuff. I mean, if you have a placenta that's usually as big as we used to be able to get, that's been gradually changing because some parts of the country, like I think, for example, Wyoming, um, you're allowed to train on body parts now. But yeah. it didn't used to be that way. And the dogs, what we found was that when the dogs were exposed to a full body, they had a really diff many of them had a very different reaction than they would on a part of a placenta. And so we train the dogs to do what's called a, a trained final indication mm -hmm. to clearly communicate with us that, oh, I found something here. My nose is right on top of the odor of human remains. And what we found was that when they ran into a full body, they might not do a trained indication like we're used to. And so the handlers had to learn how to read their dogs. So for example, I was deployed on um, um, the Oso landslide and had three finds on, on that slide. And my dog did not do his normal train fil final indication there, uh, but I was able to read his body language. And, uh, but anyway, to make a long story short, the year after the Oso landslide, so it must've been in 2015, I went to my first body farm experience. And there are, you know, right now there are probably six or seven of them around in the country. Uh, yeah. The ones I've been to was the um, Forensic Anthropology Center at Texas State. And I've also been to the Forensic Investigation Research Center or Institute, I think, uh, at Mesa University in Colorado. And there you have a, um, uh, an, uh, an opportunity to get exposed with your dog to uh, full bodies in various stages of decomposition. Um, typically, you know, it requires that you have a certified dog and... Um, and I'll tell you what, uh, the year after I went there, I had a situation where I was deployed. It was an urban search and it was a, a night search where all of a sudden I saw my dog exhibiting very strange behavior. He was kind of almost hunkered down crawling. Um, um, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but, but, it popped in my head that that's exactly the behavior I had seen when I was at Texas State at the uh, at Facts. That was exactly the same wow. behavior. Um, he was by a fence that we couldn't get over that evening. So yeah. when we came back to the incident command center, um, I told them um, because they, they, they stopped the mission for the evening. I told them, well, you're going to have to find out how I can get back in under that fence because my dog was really exhibiting strange behavior and really wanted to get in there. And the next morning, I was deployed with a detective in tow. And uh, lo and behold, yes, there was a body about 100 feet in from the fence. And um, yeah. so anyway, I'm, say, I'm telling you that to... I guess, clarify why it's so important for us to get that kind of training. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we all, we pay every, everything out of pocket. We're volunteers. So uh, traveling to do certifications and doing things like the body farm, it's all coming out of our own pockets. Um, what was the, the second part of your question? There was a second part. I, I was just amazed at that. I actually um, was kind of curious if you could go into some of your more memorable uh, 
times. I don't want to say fines, but some of your more memorable times, but that was an amazing story. Do you have any others that you can share uh, with us about? Yeah. yeah I mean, something? obviously we can't share the things that are like open cases or whatever, right. but uh, yeah. you know, I mean, the one that for most of us that were around at that time in um, um, March, 22, 2014, mm -hmm. when, uh, you know, when the Osa landslide uh, happened and um, pushed down a 20 foot wall of mud, um, totally covering um, the little community of Steelhead. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a once in a lifetime kind of experience that we will never forget. Um, and I think it was so huge. I mean, it was 800 acres. Uh, so huge compared to the acres of 9-11, uh, for example. I mean, it was miles of right. just in places 70 foot deep uh, mud, clay and uh, sand. And in other places, splintered houses, just totally yeah. splintered. Yeah. Uh, and in other places, you know, the river diverted. So it was just covered in water. So it was a, like a very complex search. We didn't really know what the hazards were and what we were sending our dogs into. And the, I think the other aspect of it that was that we ended up working side by side with family um, because they were, they were actually deployed uh, with us, with firefighters and heavy equipment and everything else. Sure you know, really added uh, an emotional layer that we don't usually see. I mean, usually we stay away from family when we are deployed. Uh, the people that are designated to work uh, specifically with, uh, with a family. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I, I remember one of the first days I was out there running in, you know, I was heading to a particular assignment and I ran into a father that was out there collecting items from his little kid. And so he had a pile of clothes and the doll and it, it was, uh, yeah, it was heartbreaking. And he asked us, can you please have your dog search here for my little girl? And, you know, those are the heartbreaking moments. Um, so it's like the tragedy of being deployed on something like that. And, but at the same time, the, uh, you know, the, um, I wouldn't say celebration, but the sense of achievement when you, when you have, when you find the deceased. Well, and um, oh. I never think that families have closure, but at least you have some level of resolution that you bring. Um, so, yeah, so that was definitely um the one that stands out the most in my, in my mind. Well, just playing that part uh, of returning the loved one to their family uh, is just, I, I, I totally understand where you're coming from with the sense of achievement. I think that's a great way to put it. And um, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful that there are people like you and, and what you're doing that are able to be involved with that and, and able to help families find that resolution, if you will. Um, is there any particular breed of dog that you would say is, is more prone to be able to detect better than another breed? Or is it kind of just how you train each, each breed? Well, so uh, <laughs> one of the legacies I'd like to leave in the search and rescue canine community is as a myth buster. <laughs> Uh, particularly <laughs> when I entered in 2001, uh, and for many years, there were so many myths, you know, ranging from um, don't train a dog in obedience because it will kill their drive. Um, you know, you can only use bloodhounds for trailing. Um, don't ever use food to reward your dog, which was a horrible thing for my dog because he, he would literally kill for a hot dog. <laughs> and he oh, was sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I, so that's, I would like to be a myth buster. And one of the myths that I think has been uh, killed is that of there is only one breed uh, or two breeds or three breeds. I think it's all dependent on the dogs. And I would say that there are certain breeds that probably 
um, are, are better at it than others. You know, I would say that breeds that tend to be um, really high drive and um, uh, have the stamina to do this kind of thing. Uh, but nowadays, I see anything from border collies to Malinois to shepherds to my dogs are, are labs, uh, right. goldens, uh, springer spaniels, you name it. Um, and they can all do the work. I think it's more individual to the dog. Um, and professional uh, search and rescue volunteers and nowadays, I think, are very careful in how they select their dogs. Um, my first dog, you know, two months after 9-11, I found myself on a boat from one of the islands out here with my first dog, my search and rescue dog, who was a great pet and a medium drive dog. So I literally had to work myself sick to get the drive up in that dog and, you know, to get him to actually become a, a good, decent uh, search and rescue dog. But I promised myself that I'll never do that again. You know, henceforth, I will make sure I am careful about the breeder and the line um, yeah. that I'm getting. And so my second dog and my current, both my dogs um, were carefully selected for, um, you know, their independence, their stamina, their, their hunt drive. Uh, you know, you want to be able to throw a tennis ball out in the grass uh, and have them search for it for hours. You yeah. know, the, the dog that goes in and says, no, I can't find it. and comes right back out. Doesn't have the hunt drive that you, that you want. Right. Oh, sure. You yeah. Want to, you want an independent dog that uh, isn't constantly looking back at you seeking for, you know, what should I be doing here? Yeah. Um, and they have to have the nerve strength to, um, you know, work alongside heavy equipment, um, you know, in wilderness with a lot of other searchers and whatnot. And so in answer to your question, uh, I think that the community has increasingly become um, not breed discriminatory, but that has evolved over time. And I think in general, training has become much more oriented, much more customized to this particular dog. Because yeah. I've, had, I've had a dog that I probably wouldn't have trained in mul multiple disciplines because he needed kind of black and white. To um, my older dog, Cab, was certified in avalanche, first responder disaster, uh, wilderness, air scent, and in human remains detection. And she was very able at distinguish between the commands and, and that. Um, so, so I'm not sure if I'm making sense, but I think that oh, yeah, rather sure. than looking at the breed, you look at the dog and yes, you know, there are certain breeds that I would go to, um, prefer to other breeds. Mm -hmm. um, does that answer your question? It does. Yeah. And I, I just was noticing the pictures behind you. Uh, I'm assuming those are all pictures of, of your labs. Uh, yes, they are. You. Yes. That, that up there on the calendar, that's uh, Keb, who ah. is, um, she is the um, key character in a, uh, an adventure memoir that I've been writing with uh, one of my colleagues and that hopefully oh. will be published sometime in the next 12 months yeah tell us about it if oh, you can don't let the don't let the cat out of the bag so to speak uh, <laughs> or actually no pun intended but uh, tell us about that well so um a canine team has three prongs you have the handler you have the dog and then you have the field support okay. and the field support is typically responsible for navigation radio communications looking out for hazards that kind of a thing and for a handler, if you can find a good field support, he or she is worth its weight, her weight in gold. Mm -hmm. And I found a guy many years ago. Um, his name is Guy, actually, uh, who has deployed with me and my dog uh, over the years, many, many times. And um, he approached me some four or five years ago and he said, you know, these are some incredible things that we have experienced. Why don't we write a book and share our story? 
you know, the general public has no idea what we're yeah. doing in search and rescue with our, with our dogs. It would be good education. Um, and I, I wasn't that keen on the idea initially, but the, I kind of warmed up to the idea. Yeah. And I said, well, if we can make it more than just telling the stories to, for me, I need to have a bigger purpose. It's like, I'd like, I'm so passionate about uh, my dogs and what we're doing. So if, if we can write the do- book and have it inspire other people that are quote unquote, looking for their why in life, looking for their passion and, you know, show people that you can find ways to make a meaningful difference in the world and mm-hmm. become really passionate about it. And I said, then, then I'm hip to it. And so this was like four or five years ago, we started writing our book and uh, we uh, submitted a manuscript about, oh gosh, 12 months ago and got an agent right away. We only submitted wow. six manuscripts, which is like really fortunate. <laughs> and um, she's an agent in New York and she's been working with us now and she's out um, pitching to publishers. So. Hopefully it will come out in, in the next 12 months. They say it takes a long time for publishers, but yeah, um, the, the preliminary title is Search for the Dead. And ah. it's different missions we've been on. Um, oftentimes times, places, and names have been changed to preserve confidentiality and be respectful mm-hmm. of yeah. family, et cetera. But I, th- I think it will be for the general public, it will be an interesting kind of view behind the scenes. Well, you're going to have to let us know when that comes out so we can add that to our library of, of books that we have that's uh, beginning to grow again. So we'll be excited to see that. You talked I, about... I remembered what you asked that I didn't a- answer. And that no, was, that was you, it. It was about uh, um, using cemeteries. Yeah. Well, you talked a little bit about your. Uh, you've got a master trainer coming out that's going to be, I think we said training in cemeteries. Um, so it kind of goes along with that of why using uh, cemeteries and how does that help with the training process? And, and if you can tie that in with maybe about the master trainer that's coming from Tennessee that you mentioned. I'd be glad to. Um, I'm the president of Cascadia Search Dogs, and we are uh, an organization committed to um, supporting high quality training for search and rescue dogs. Mm -hmm. And uh, several of our members are members of the Washington State SAR planning unit. And that's uh, an organization that gets called in on very complex large scale evidence searches in Washington state. So okay. there are times when they bring in, you know, dozens of human remains detection dogs. And in talking to um, Guy, who happens to be my co-author, but also a director of that uh, group, um, he was mentioning that, you know, it didn't seem like the uh, dogs in general um, were that successful at finding the old cold cases, you know, small bones, scattered bones, that kind of a thing. And yeah. so they started up a committee, which I'm a m- member of, and uh, to, to explore uh, how we could improve the effectiveness of the dogs. And uh, uh, so, so that, that committee is currently working on that. And one of the things we found was that how we train the dogs may be part of the problem. Sure. And uh, um, in, the, in researching all of that, we found people in other parts of the country that have been doing historical uh, human remains detection for a long time, you know, particularly in parts of the country, maybe where there are uh, where civil war uh, graves, that kind of a thing. Right, um, yeah. And so became connected with that and found uh, a guy, his name is Paul Martin, who is traveling across the country, um, helping train human remains detection dogs in becoming more effective at these kinds of searches where you have disarticulated remains, old bones, that kind of a thing. And um, and also historical search, you know, where they work with archaeologists and maybe maybe there's a construction going up and, and the construction company wants to make sure that there aren't any graves on the site or whatever. So they call in right. human protection dogs. Um, 
So anyway, make long story short, then we decided to bring him in. And so he's coming and we have invited 12 uh, certified human remains, human remains detection teams from throughout the state to come to this training for five days. Uh, two of those days will be on cemeteries because, um, you know, how do you replicate a 20 year old grave or bones right. that are that old. Um, it's very, very faint odor compared to what the dogs typically are being trained on. Mm -hmm. And so they found that actually working in cemeteries where you can find um, graves that are maybe a uh, hundred or more years old, you know, preferably before embalming because yeah. you don't want the dogs to be trained to alert on the uh, chemicals in, you know, in whatever they use to embalm. Um, but they found that the dogs can become very proficient at uh, pinpointing where the remains are. Mm -hmm. And so there are places that bring in the dogs specifically to, you know, plot where the remains are in the cemetery. Um, well, as you, as you know, uh, just because there is a gravestone there doesn't necessarily mean that the remains are right under it, right? That's and very so, key. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the remains have been removed and placed elsewhere. Yeah. And um, so anyway, um, we, we started contacting uh, cemeteries up here in Snohomish County, and we found actually they've been very, um, very collaborative. And we have a couple identified at this stage that we'll be using um, you know, it's useful if you, if there is a map uh, of the uh, cemetery and so that, you know, you know, for sure that the dogs are, are indicating on the right thing. Um, but um, anyway, it will be really interesting to learn about this. Uh, and, you know, we're hoping to develop that expertise in Washington state. And it is so interesting to see what evolves. I mean, I would never have guessed that that would be on a podcast with you uh, <laughs> if you'd asked me a, a month ago. Yeah. And so, you know, what's next? I don't know. We're looking for partnerships to uh, move this forward in Washington State. So, you know, whether that's Absolutely. partnering with funeral directors or archaeologists or we don't know exactly yet but it's a really exciting journey yeah so i'm curious uh, a couple things um we hear a lot of times where families have said well we took you know dad's cremated remains and we scattered them are you able to or, or i should say are the dogs able to detect uh cremation remains uh as well as as remains that maybe weren't treated or, or, you know, fell where they were, are they able to, uh, to detect the, the cremated remains as well? They are. In fact, we do specifically train dogs on cremated remains um, and burnt bones and things like that, because, okay. uh, you know, in all the fires down in California, dogs sure. were a very important part of that. <laughs> And uh, but it, and you get into uh, well, people spread the uh, ashes or whatever. Or, you know, is your dog gonna go alert all over? Um, one of the questions we are really discussing discussing in the human remains detection community right now is the fact that in Washington State, you know, we have the um, um, what do you call it? You're making. Uh, taking remains and making it into fertilizer, essentially. Oh, natural organic reduction. Yeah, that was actually yeah. going to be my next question is, is how does that work? Are they able to detect the soil that has been created due to natural organic reduction? Well, that is the big question, right? My, my guess would be yes. Okay. And uh, from what I understand, you know, there will not be records kept as to who is bringing that home into what backyard or whatever, which means right. it will become a much more complex picture for human remains detection dogs because they might be called in to look for a clandestine grave in somebody's backyard and start alerting, but it might be because somebody put the compost there, right? Sure. So and anyway... It's a lot of discussion around that right now in our community. Have you had any conversations with any of the current licensees that are that are uh, offering organic natural organic reduction? 
Yeah, in fact, I saw there was a thread on um, in a Facebook private group the other day that they, they started discussing that and uh, I, I need to go back, but it's very fresh, you know, it's just happening yeah. right now. So I yeah, don't, it's... I don't think we know all the implications of it. Um, yeah. That will be interesting to follow. Well, we can connect you with, so we've got uh, all three licensees are members of the association, so we can get you connected with the right people Excellent. to talk to. See, I told you, we don't know what's next, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Couple, uh, another question I had going back to the cemetery uh, I, I understand not, you know, not wanting the dog to key in on maybe some of the remains of embalmed remains. Do vaults or caskets play a, a factor in the, that detection? If, if, a, if a person was buried in a casket with a vault, would they be able to detect something like that? Or is, are we talking graves where maybe the caskets collapsed or there was no casket or no vault? Does yeah, that... That's a really good question. And actually, those are questions that I'm kind of saving up and jotting down as I'm uh, looking forward to our workshop in, in June. Yeah. But, um, um, and, but I know, as I've been out looking in, in uh, cemeteries, that you, know, you can see where the graves have collapsed or whatever. I mean, that's a pretty good right. indication that there was a casket. Um, you also have the whole issue of different kinds of caskets and what yeah. impact that has on decomposition. And then you have uh, one casket in one cemetery versus another cemetery with different soil. You know, maybe you have clay-based soil in one and sand-based soil in another, but they're buried at exactly the same depth, Absolutely. but the yeah. decomp is gonna be very different. Sure. That's why I was telling you earlier, it's like the science that we're getting involved in here is so exciting to me. Um, sure. yeah. Now, all of a sudden, I'm becoming a geologist. Not really, but <laughs> <laughs> looking around a little bit and learning as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, I mean, if you have a vault or whatever, um, I mean, it, that's probably going to be harder uh, than if you were just buried in soil, right? Depends on how much, po how porous everything is and how sure. much odor can actually seep out. Yeah. Well, Suzanne, this has really been interesting to me. This is something that I have not spent a lot of time in uh, or thinking about, but it's really been eye-opening of what is going on out there with what you guys are doing and how that plays into effect with what we do at the funeral home. It, it's, it's very much a um, relationship that we can work together for sure. Um, and I'm just grateful that you guys are doing this, that you're taking the time to train. Uh, you said that this is all volunteer. Is there a way people can uh, donate monies to your organization to, to maybe help defer some of those costs of, of doing some of that training? Absolutely. In fact, one of the things we would like to raise money for is a, a ground penetrating radar, which we use in conjunction with the dogs. Sure. Um, but yeah, our organization is a not-for-profit. Uh, the um, uh, the um, URL is uh, csdk9.org. So Cascadia Search Dogs K9.org, csdk9.org. Oh, okay. And people can donate there, there towards uh, this kind of training that we're getting now. Okay. And, and how if, if they wanted to get in touch with you, if they have specific questions that maybe I didn't come up with, at this time, how can they get in touch with you and, and ask you those questions? Do you have an email? Uh, just, just email me. Yeah. Uh, my email is S as in Sam, my first name, S L Sult. So S E L S H U L T at H R N O W dot net. So S L Sult at H R N O W dot net. Great. Suzanne, uh, thank you. Thank you for coming on and sharing this with us, um, sharing your story. This is, like I say, it's been something that is, I was excited the first time I got the phone call uh, that, that was talking about this. I wanted to get you guys on here. And so I, I'm really grateful that you did. Uh, we want to help you out and, and share your story as well. So hopefully when people watch this, they'll be in touch with you and, and um, I'd love to have you come back out actually and, and be on our show again, maybe in a, in a year and kind of just see how things have, have um, 
transpired over the year. Of course, by then, maybe we'll get a uh, signed copy of that book that's coming out, too. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. But I well, appreciate the opportunity a lot. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, I, like I say. And at this point, we'll go ahead and close it up. But um, as always, uh, like us, review, uh, follow us on YouTube. Thanks, Suzanne, for coming out and being a part of Member Talks. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.